Dear friends, welcome to ePartshala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Miliband, Polantas and Lakla on the Advanced Capitalist State, which is part of the paper on political sociology. This module will try and capture the debate that took place between Miliband and Polantas and later the remarks uh, of Ernesto Lakla and um, his compatriots on what is the nature of the capitalist state in western societies or in advanced societies. Marxist theorists have traditionally neglected the study of the nature of the state in modern societies, seeing it largely as an epiphenomena reducible to economic base. They hold that the relationship of domination and subordination in the infrastructure will be largely reproduced in the superstructure of which the state is a part. Thus, the decisions and activities of the state will inevitably favor the interests of the ruling class rather than the proletariat. Marx and Engels did not develop a systematic theorizing of the political and their work on the state comprises diverse philosophical, theoretical, journalistic, partisan or purely ad hoc comments. Talking about the modern state in the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx had famously remarked that it, have, it was nothing but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. He regarded bourgeoisie democracy as the advocate form of political organization in consolidated capitalist social formations. The liberal democratic state form corresponds to the value for form of the capitalist mode of production and provides a suitable extra economic support for it. The freedom of economic agents to engage in exchange is matched by the freedom of individual citizens. Finally, Marx and Engels also held that the state would eventually disappear once the classes disappeared. Post World War II, several Marxist scholars advocated a theory of state monopoly capitalism which was based on an immediate identification of the state with the interest of capital. It held that the socialization of production and the associated concentration of centralization of capital had forced the state to take on many of the functions of capital in the attempt to avert an economic crisis and to stabilize the class struggle. One of the main rivals to Marxist theorizing on state was the social democratic theory of the state which focused on the institutional separation of the state from the economy and so stressed the autonomy of the state as a political institution. This analytical separation of the political from the economic was based theoretically on a radical separation of production from distribution. The class character of the state was determined not by its intervention in production, but by its relation to distribution, which it could modify primarily through its taxation and expenditure policies. Thus, a social democratic government could in principle use the instruments of state power to counterbalance the economic power of capital, reconciling the economic efficiency of the capitalist mode of production with an equitable system of distribution. Like in post-war Britain, the Labour government was able to carry out massive welfare measures, including the setting up of the famed National Health Services, which served to buttress the social democratic view of state. The state might serve the state might even serve as the instrument for the transition to socialism, transforming property relations by taking capitalist enterprises into public ownership. However, the crisis in the social democracies of the West in the 1970s brought a renewed thinking within Marxism on the role and nature of the state and the question about the relative autonomy of the state in capitalist societies. The existing theories were found to be inadequate. If the theory of state monopoly capitalism underestimated the autonomy of the state, the social democratic theory underestimated the limits of that autonomy. Nicholas Polantas criticized the existing Marxist approaches to the state as inadequate for many reasons. Economic reductionism that emphasized the logic of capitalist development or economic class struggle at the expense of the specifically political dimension of the state and state power. Historicist approaches which emphasize the transformative potential of an autonomous political caste struggle without regard to the strategically selective institutional legacies of political structures 
and state monopoly capitalism views which claimed power in the contemporary state was exercised exclusively by monopoly capital at the expense of other capitalist groups as well as the subaltern classes. Many Marxist scholars inspired by Italian theorist Antonio Gramsci began to insist on the specificity of the political and the irreducibility of the political to the economic conflicts. What were needed were a more adequate theory of nature and limits of power of the capitalist state. Within Marxism, the debate on the state in advanced capitalist societies coalesced into two contrasting positions, popularly termed as the instrumentalist and the structuralist view of the state. Ralph Miliband and the sociology of the state in ad advanced capitalist societies. The instrumentalist view of the state saw it as an instrument that can be used by different social forces for different purposes. Within Marxism, this view was best epitomized by British sociologist Ralph Miliband's landmark work, The State in Capitalist Society, which came out in 1969. To understand the nature of the state, Miliband argues for a general political sociology of advanced capitalism. He says that these capitalist societies have many common economic and social features like high level of industrialization, an economy dominated by private capital, especially corporations, capital labor as a principal social relations, presence of economic elite and formal democratic institutions. Miliband's study focused on how the embedding of a formally democratic state in a substantively capitalist society limits the apparent autonomy of elected governments and thereby promotes the functional adequacy of the exercise of state power for and behalf of capital. Miliband begins by critiquing the lack of Marxist theorizing on state giving, given that it is for a state's attention that men compete. He also critiques them for not studying the state in the light of the concrete socio-political cultural reality of actual capitalist society. His main goal is to criticize bourgeoisie political science, especially its claim about the separation of ownership and control produced by the managerial revolution and its continuing claims about the open, pluralistic, democratic nature of government in the modern democratic state. He critiqued the pluralists for treating the questions on, of state's nature as resolved and focusing on study of political processes like voting and political socialization. The pluralist view of state saw the state as more or less a ne neutral arbitrator which tried to accommodate multiple and conflicting interests of different groups in society. For Miliband, however, the state was a special institution whose main purpose was to defend the predominance of a particular class and that it was an entity that extends well beyond the executive and legislative branches of elected government. Through a detailed examination of empirical data, he shows how different government institutions and actors are deeply embedded in a capitalist market economy and a civil society dominated by institutions and forces imbued with capitalist values and more or less committed to capitalist interests. Miliband said that political equality was one of the greatest myths of the epoch and that bourgeoisie freedom and democracy does not threaten the class domination as the ruling class control knowledge and value production and framing of rules. He argues that class rule in these societies is compatible with a wide range of civil and political liberties. The basic political assumption informing Miliband's analysis is that there cannot be a parliamentary road to socialism because the bourgeoisie democratic state will remain inherently unreformable as long as radical movements continue to work only in and through established political institutions. Miliband's study shows how capital in advanced studies had a definite advantage over the groups in influencing the state. Firstly, the contemporary western state is run by elites who largely act to defend the interests of the ruling class. These elites share a basic interest in preservation of private property and capitalism. Many of those who occupy elite positions are themselves members of the bourgeoisie. For example, he pointed out how in America from 1899 to 1949, 60% of the cabinet members were businessmen. Like C. W. Wright Mills, Power Elite, which was a landmark study of elite rule in America, Miliband study shows how elites in Western capitalist society, be it judges, politicians or civil servants, are united by ties of close friendship, kinship, 
common outlook and mutual interest. He argues that capital and labor do not compete on equal terms and that the former has massive advantage over the latter in influencing state policy. Business has much power to veto a bill which it considers detrimental to the pursuit of profit. Then there is the global power of capitalist class which also limits the autonomy of the state in bringing out welfare measures in favor of the proletariat. In India itself one can see how global investment rating firms and bank pressurize the government against taking broad social development measures like the food security bill. Meanwhile, labor is fragmented and the power of trade unions is limited by its ideology which encourages frequent compromises. The political class defends interests of the capitalists because they find it easy to equate that with the defense of national interest. Social democratic parties are not radical enough and come to see politics as a matter of parliamentary strategies, tactics and maneuver. In recent times, Noam Chomsky has also chronicled the strong relationship between the state and the business elites, the persistence of the military industrial complex which severely restricts the democratic and public character of the state. Miliband also examined the important question as to why the majority of the population accepts a state which acts against their interests. For him, the economic power of the ruling class enabled them to partly shape the beliefs and wishes of the remainder of population. Through a process he calls legitimation, the capitalist class sought to persuade society not only to accept the policies it advocates, but also the ethos, the values and the goals which are its own. Miliband illustrated his argument with an analysis of advertising by means of which capitalist enterprises promote both the products and the acceptable face of capitalism. He argues that capitalism and its commodities are subtly linked via advertisement to integrity, reliability, security, parental love, sociability. With these kinds of associations, the exploitative and oppressive nature of capitalism is effectively disguised. Talking about the role of the state in the future, Miliband argues that bourgeoisie democratic states are likely to move towards conservative authoritarianism as the inability to match performance with promise becomes more blatant. Nikos Polantas, the state class relations as an objective one. Another Marxist view of the state which became popular in the 1970s and which was heavily influenced by ideas of the French theorist Louis Althusser is a structuralist view of the state which held that the state had has a distinctive functionally specific class character and was structurally constrained to advance the interests of the capital. Political sociologist Nicholas Polantaz, who was its main articulator, aimed to develop new Marxist political science by moving from more abstract to more concrete analysis and to a lesser extent from the simple to the complex. Polantaz published a detailed critique of Miliband in the New Left Review called The Problem of Cap the Capitalist State in 1969. He agreed with Miliband about the relative autonomy of capitalist state but this agreed on the basis of that autonomy. Firstly, he argued that Miliband was mistaken in his belief that a Marxist approach could be based on a critique of non-Marxist approaches that focus on revealing their factual errors. This placed Miliband on the terrain and trapped him into a debate on their terms. He says that Miliband's empiricist methodology had neglect of Marxian concepts inevitably reproduces the conceptual apparatus of social democratic ideology and that it is not enough to oppose concrete facts to concepts but rather they must be attacked by parallel concepts situated in a different problematic. Secondly, Miliband has had adopted a problematic of the subject that is a concern with individual agents and the motives rather than with classes and their interests which Polantas argues gives the impression that social classes of the state is reducible to interpersonal relations, thus undermining the Marxist understanding of state and class as objective structures. Polantas holds that the state should not be viewed simply as a state in capitalist society, but must be understood as a capitalist state, a state in which capitalist class relations are embodied in its very institutional form. For Polantas, the state is defined as the instance that maintains a cohesion 
of a social formation which reproduces the conditions of production of a social system. This means that if the function of the state in a determinate social formation and the interests of the dominant class collide, it is by reason of the system itself. The direct participation of ruling class in state apparatus is not the cause but the effect. He emphasizes the fact that the relation between class and state is objective and that state does not depend on the motivations of social actors. Unlike Miliband who considers the capitalist class as a unitary force with somewhat singular sphere of concern so that it negotiates with the state in order to sustain its rule, Polantas argues that the relative autonomy of the state is functionally necessary to prevent capitalist collective failures. Polantas says that the capitalist state best serves the interests of the capital class only when the members of this class do not participate directly in the state apparatus. That is to say that when the ruling class is not the politically governing class. Polantas gave several reasons for the relative autonomy of the capitalist state. As a group of the bourgeoisie is not free from internal division and conflicts, the state must also have the freedom to make concessions to the subject class which might be opposed by the bourgeoisie. Such concessions serve to diffuse radical working class protest and to contain the demand within the framework of a capitalist economy. Polantas also pointed out the epistemological and theoretical errors seen as evident in Miliband's critique of the managerial revolution thesis and the alleged neutrality of the state bureaucracy. He says that Miliband creates a false problem of managerialism by trying to show that managers are pursuing profits for companies whereas the real contradiction is between socialization of productive forces and the private appropriation, not the mere pursuit of profit. And finally, Polantas argues that Miliband had neglected a key role of the ideological state apparatuses in securing social cohesion in a class divided society. He agreed with Miliband about the importance of the process of legitimation in maintaining the capitalist system. However, he went further in seeing this process as being directly related to the state. Following Louis Althusser, he divided the state into the repressive state apparatus, the army, government, administration, police, which relies on the use of coercion and the ideological state apparatus, the church, political parties, trade unions, which is concerned with the manipulation of values and beliefs rather than the use of force. The ideological state apparatus are crucial for survival of capitalism as they inhibit the growth of class consciousness. The views of Polantas on the nature and function of the state in advanced capitalist society has undergone certain shifts, while at the same time retaining the primacy of autonomy of the political sphere. In his first major contribution to Marxist state theory, political power and social classes, which came out in 1968, Polantas introduced the notion of the capitalist state, of the capitalist type of state, which is formally adequate to capitalism. He described it as a hierarchically organized centrally coordinated sovereign territorial state based on the rule of law and in its ideal typical normal form combined with a bourgeoisie democratic form of government. The state form facilitates capital accumulation and political class domination but obscures this fact by disguising this economic exploitation and the exercise of class power. He implicitly distinguished this normal type of state from states in capitalist societies which are formally inadequate and therefore depend far more on constant political improvisation and on force, fraud, corruption to secure such domination. Bolantas drew on Gramsci to argue that in such a capitalist state, political class domination could not rest on a legal monopoly of class power but would depend on the dominant classes capacity to promote a hegemonic project that identify the national popular interest with the long term interest of the capitalist class and its allies in the power block. For only when the state's narrow economic and political administrative and ideological functions are subordinated to its global political function, that is securing social cohesion in a class divided society, can they contribute effectively to creating and maintaining capital's long term domination. Hegemony thus becomes important to understand how it was possible for an institutionally separate, relatively autonomous state to secure long-term political interests of capital. In his later writings on state like classes in contemporary capitalism, 
which came out in 1973, Polentas tried to emphasize more on the role of the classes in explaining the relative autonomy of the state. Polentas, having initially focused on the pure form of capitalist type of state at a high level of abstraction, took more account of forms of state, varieties in political regimes, changes in class composition and forms of struggle, the crucial distinction between normal and exceptional forms of state and the value of democratic institutions in the struggle for the democratic socialism. He views the state as a social relations to emphasize even more the role of class struggle in the constitution of power. Polentas cautions against the institutional analysis of power and state. The idea that it is the structure, institutions which hold or wield power with the relations of power between social groups flowing from this institutional power. Polenta says that to attribute specific power to the state or to designate structures or institutions as the field of application of this concept of power would be to fall into structuralism. By attributing the principal role in the transformation of social formations to these organs, he says we need to break with a certain positivist or even psychosociological connection of power. A brings pressure to bear on B to make the latter do something he would not have done without pressure from A. He says that we have to comprehend the relations of power as class relations and explain the relative autonomy of the state by looking at the constitution of classes and the relations between them. He agrees with other scholars that the separation of the economic and political provides a general framework depending upon the different stages and phases of capitalism. This separation is itself liable to transformation. For an examination of the relative autonomy of this capitalist state. However, unlike others, Polentas holds that the concrete form taken by this autonomy depends upon the precise conjecture of class struggle at any given one point. He says that one cannot therefore answer this question in general form precisely on account of the conjecture on the conjuncture of the class struggle. All this means is that the relative autonomy of the state capitalist state stems precisely from the contradictory relations of power between the different social classes. He says that the conceiving of the capitalist state as a relation as being structurally shot through and constituted with and by class contradictions means firmly grasping the fact that an institution that is the state is destined to reproduce class divisions cannot really be monolithic, fissureless block, but is itself by virtue of its very structure, the state is a relation, divided. Miliband's response to Polentas' critique. Miliband responded back to Polentas in the New Left Review in 1970, accusing him of relying on structural super-determinism, an exaggerated concern with the structural constraint on state autonomy and ignoring the role of empirical material in developing a critique of the state. He says that Polentas goes much too far in dismissing the nature of the state elite as of altogether no account. The structural constraints of the system are so absolutely compelling as to turn those who run the state into the mere functionaries and executants of policies imposed upon them by the system. Miliband points out that Polentas claim the capitalist type of state tends to be Bonapartist, that is to acquire a certain independence from the social forces in the wider society, leads to a failure to distinguish between fascism and democracy, and therefore one could not appreciate the virtues of a democratic regime for democratic struggle. Finally, Miliband says that Polentas was mistaken in treating ISAs as part of the state in its narrow sense as opposed to the political system more generally. Miliband says that economism re-enters Polentas' analysis through the back door in the guise of the inevitable class character of state power. Miliband concludes that the structuralism of Polentas prevents us from understanding and analyzing the relative autonomy of state. Ernesto Laclau and the importance of the analytic of hegemony. The Miliband Polentas debate generated a lot of scholarship on the nature of state. Laclau, an Argentinian social theorist who was familiar with Althusserian 
structuralism and aware of the complexities of political struggles attacked both writers on the grounds that they had made complementary methodological errors. While Miliband was seen as erring not constructing his own theory and testing it against other theories, Polanthas has erred as he constructed his own theory but neglected to demonstrate its superiority in empirical grounds. Locklaw further criticized Polanthas for his over formalistic approach to studying the state. Polanthas's concept of instances, economic, political and ideological, whose intentions, whose interactions produce the mode of production was questioned. The Althu Althusserian inspired conception of instances, economic, political and ideological are seen as both specific and autonomous with respect to each other and whose interaction produces the mode of production determined by the economic in the last resort, but in which another instance may play the import the dominant role. Laclau says that this position inevitably leads to formalism and taxonomism in establishing the relations between the various instances, the content, the content of their concepts and construction of their object. Laclau says that as a result we treat the economic instance as unequivocal, in other words as having the same meaning and the same content in all modes of production. Borrowing from Gramsci's studies on hegemony, Laclau attacks the implicit economic determinism in both Althusser and Polanthas and instead posits the autonomy of the political. Laclau along with Chantal Mouffe in the landmark work Hegemony and Socialist Strategy which came out in 1976 attempted to radicalize the Marxist understanding of the political by deconstructing many of the traditional theories of Marxism. They argued that the conceptual and methodological foundations of Marxism are inadequate to comprehend contemporary social reality and accused Marxist structuralists as ignoring the rise of new social movements which challenged many of the given ideas of Marxism on power agency, class and state. Drawing on the work of Lacan, Foucault, Derrida and Barthe, the work heralded a post-structuralist turn within Marxism and advocated the new, the use of tools of discourse analysis in order to articulate innovative analysis of concrete political phenomena. They stressed the idea that political identities were not immediately given and as always constructed on the basis of complex discursive practices. Politics is not the expression of pre-given interests or the will of a certain group, but politics is to be understood as the very process by which a group assumes its name. Stressing the contingency of the political field, Lakla and Mouffe argue that the identity of a given social group cannot be derived from a stable ground within the social. It can only be result of the process of hegemonic signification or articulation. Working to extend Gramsci's elaboration of the concept of hegemony, Laclau sees hegemony not as the imposition of a pre-given set of ideas, but as something that emerges from the political interaction of groups. It is not simply the domination by an elite, but in, instead is a process of ongoing struggle that constitutes the social. Revisiting the Miliband Polintas debate. Revisiting the debate on the relative autonomy of the state between Miliband and Polintas in contemporary time, Bob Jessup argues that it was mostly a non debate as it involved a different theoretical object and different lines of argument. He says that there were fundamental differences in their approaches to the philosophy of social science and the methodology of theory construction, with Polintas more concerned with abstract questions and theoretical coherence and Miliband more concerned with political relevance and empirical evidence. This misunderstanding is also rooted in part in the different political contexts of their work, with Polantas writing in a context marked by relatively abstract theoretical debates and Marxist polemics on state monopoly, capitalism and Miliband writing a context dominated by Anglo-American empiricism and debates on pluralism. Bob Jessup 
argued that Miliband and Poluntas conceived the capital state in such radically different and fundamentally incommensurable terms that they were actually discussing two different types of theoretical objects. Poluntas was concerned with the capitalist type of state, Miliband with the state in capitalist societies. Jessop says that this misunderstanding was reinforced because the two men also adopted different strategies for presenting their respective objects. While Polantas tends to move from the most abstract determinations of the capitalist state to its more concrete forms and dynamics, Miliband tends to move from more visible aspects of capitalist societies to some of the more hidden aspects or fundamental structures structural constraints on the exercise of state power in a capitalist society, whatever the state's specific institutional form. Polantas was essentially concerned with the formal adequacy of the capitalist state, capitalist type of state and Miliband with the functional adequacy of the state in capitalist society. This debate thus reproduces the failure to distinguish between an abstract theoretical concern with the capitalist type of state and an empirical analysis of the state in capitalist society as a real concrete phenomena. However, Jessop says that Polantas and Miniband did converge on some issues, a positive evaluation of a democratic socialism, the value of new social movements, the importance of human rights and the critique of authoritarian statism. To conclude, therefore, we saw that Miliband's argument basically was focusing on how the capitalist state is directly controlled by the bourgeoisie class, whereas Polantas wanted to bring about a certain ingredient in which he believes that it also has a certain relative autonomy from the bourgeoisie classes and also from different classes. Finally, post-structuralist analysis of class in the works of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. Thank you.